Andrew Paul Gosden, was born to Kevin and Glennis Gosden, on July 10, 1993, in Doncaster, South Yorkshire, England. In 2007, Andrew was living in a suburb of Doncaster, and was attending the Macaulay Catholic High School. He was a highly talented individual who excelled in his studies, especially in mathematics. He had an immaculate attendance record at school not having missed a single day thus far. His high intelligence allowed him to cruise through his education, and he never really worried about performing well. Andrew was even on the Young Gifted and Talented program, which was specifically designed to enhance the educational development of the top 5% of the students. His father Kevin, said that despite his intelligence, Andrew was not very street smart, which made him vulnerable. Andrew was described as a shy and quiet kid who was mature beyond his years but not overtly social. But he did have a small group of like-minded friends. He never displayed any signs of depression, and there were no indications of being bullied. He seemed content with his life, happy with his video games and metal music. And though he was 14 years old at the time, Andrew looked far younger than his age. He had a small build, wore strong prescription glasses, was deaf in one ear and had a unique double ridge on his right ear. After summer holidays ended, Andrew was eight days into the new school year. During that time, on two separate occasions, Andrew apparently chose to walk home from school rather than take the bus. It was unusual because it was a 6.4 kilometers or a four mile long route, which would have taken him almost an hour and a half to make the journey home. His mother and father questioned this, but later thought less of it. On the morning of September 14, 2007, Andrew was uncharacteristically late in waking up, and seemed particularly irritable. His mother Glennis, brushed it off thinking it was just normal teenage behavior. Despite this, he got dressed and headed to school at 8.05 am. A family friend had seen Andrew, walking across the local park to his usual bus stop that morning. However, instead of taking the school bus, Andrew for some reason, walked to a nearby ATM, and took out 200 pounds from his bank account. He waited at the park till 8.30 am, by which time his parents would have left for work. Andrew was captured on their neighbor's CCTV footage, walking back to his home. Andrew changed out of his school uniform, placing his blazer on the back of a chair in his bedroom, and throwing his shirt and trousers into the washing machine. He then wore some casual clothes, a black slipknot t-shirt and black jeans, and took a bag which had various patches of rock and metal bands. He also took his wallet, keys, and his PSP console, but he didn't take the charger for the PSP. It is believed that he didn't take his coat or sweatshirt, and also did not take the 100 pounds cash that he had saved up from his birthdays. He was captured on a neighbor's CCTV footage heading down Littlemore Lane, back towards the park. He walked to the local train station, and bought a one-way ticket to London. Andrew boarded the train at 9.35 am. A woman who sat next to him on the train said she remembers him, as being quiet and fully engrossed in playing a game on his PSP. Andrew arrived in London at 11.20 am, and CCTV footage captured him leaving the station at 11.25. This was the last confirmed sighting of Andrew. Meanwhile, staff at his school noticed that he was missing, and attempted to call his parents, but they had the wrong number. This resulted in his disappearance being noted by his family much later that day. When his parents returned home that evening, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The Gosden family sat around the dining table preparing to eat dinner. They assumed that Andrew was either in the converted cellar playing video games, or in his room doing homework. When the family realized that he was not in the house, they initially thought he could be with a friend or a neighbor, and had simply lost track of time. At 7 p.m., following various phone calls, it dawned on the Gosdens that something was wrong. After learning that Andrew had skipped school that day, finally, they contacted the police. Kevin Gosden, along with his daughter Charlotte, scoured the neighborhood and the route Andrew usually took to school, but found nothing of significance. Within three hours of discovering Andrew's disappearance, a missing person leaflet was produced for circulation. Andrew's family and friends searched the area until nightfall, but found nothing. After realizing that Andrew could have only gone to London, as they had many relatives who lived there, his family informed the police about their suspicions. 
The police began searching the areas in London where the Gosden's relatives lived. However, the investigation turned up nothing. It was through a tip from the employee, who sold Andrew the train ticket, that the police confirmed that he did in fact, go to London. The ticket seller remembered Andrew, and noted that she tried to sell him a round trip, but he insisted on one way, it would only have been an extra pound to get the round trip ticket. Kevin Gosden said that it was quite possible that Andrew had traveled to meet with friends he knew in London, and Andrew knew the public transport routes exceptionally well, as he had been to the city numerous times, visiting the museums and exhibitions. Andrew didn't have social media, or even an email address, and it was unlikely that he went to London to meet anyone he met online. The only computer in the house belonged to his sister, her laptop, and Andrew didn't have access to it. The computers at Andrew's school and the computers at the local library were also checked, but nothing relating to Andrew was found. His PSP was also checked, along with his other video game console, and it didn't appear he ever used the device features that would be needed to talk to people. His sister said that Andrew had very little interest in connecting with people online, she said, he just didn't seem social. There was speculation that Andrew wanted to go to London to attend a concert. 30 Seconds to Mars was playing the day he disappeared, and there was also a show from a local band called Sick, that was playing a farewell show. Though he liked metal music, there was no evidence to show that Andrew liked either of these bands. Interestingly, Andrew's father also said that Andrew's favorite TV program was, The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, a story where the main character fakes his death and starts a new life. Andrew however, didn't take enough belongings to take an extended journey. After identifying Andrew in the CCTV footage outside of King's Cross Station, police circulated the footage along with a close-up image of his right ear, which had a distinctive double ridge, to the media. Sadly, no progress was made in finding Andrew. It was found that the initial investigation into the disappearance of Andrew Gosden was not free of errors. The police focused on the family first, and would not even scour the CCTV tapes at King's Cross before they had finished their process of clearing them, despite eyewitnesses claiming to have seen Andrew boarding the train on September 14. The CCTV footage along with the close-up of his right ear with the distinctive double ridge, was only found one month after he vanished. And by this time, most of the footage had been deleted, and the trail had gone cold. Since the teenager's disappearance, several unconfirmed sightings have been reported to the police. From what they could gather, his family believed that he went to the Pizza Hut on Oxford Street, and to Covent Garden, on the day he disappeared. In total, police received more than 120 reports of possible sightings. In November 2008, a man went into the Lemster police station, and used the intercom system to report a sighting of Andrew. However, the intercom system was used to replace a staffed reception, and by the time an officer arrived, the man had left. Police made a public appeal for the man to come forward. A man later wrote to the BBC claiming to be that man, with the details of a possible sighting in Shrewsbury. It isn't confirmed that the man was the same, nor was Andrew found in Shrewsbury. In September 2009, the family released age-progressed images of what Andrew might look like aged 16, to mark the second year of his disappearance. In November 2009, Kevin Gosden appealed to the gay community to help find his son. Andrew's family considered the possibility that he could have been struggling with his sexual orientation. Kevin Gosden stated that they are a pretty open family, and if he is gay, they do not have any issue with it. Kevin said that Andrew is loved unconditionally by both his wife and him, and his sister. In 2011, the Gosden family paid for a private sonar search of the River Thames. And despite not finding any evidence linking to Andrew, they did find another body which Kevin Gosden revealed in a podcast, and said that he hopes the find brings closure to the unnamed victim's family. Kevin also attended a Muse concert, one of Andrew's favorite bands, hoping to find him, but was unsuccessful. On September 12, 2017, a fresh appeal for information was launched by police in hopes of finding more clues. On the 10th anniversary of his disappearance, the charity Missing People, made Andrew the face of their Find Every Child campaign, with Andrew featuring on billboards and advertisements throughout the UK. In 2018, 
the Gosden family revealed that someone had sent them an online conversation with an individual and an unknown person with the username Andy Rue, who claimed that their boyfriend left them, and they needed £200 to cover rent. The person offered to send them money, but the user said that they didn't have a bank account as they had, left home when they were 14. Rue is a nickname that was given to Andrew as a child. Interestingly, a 16-year-old boy named Alex Sole, who was also a gifted mathematician, disappeared 10 months after Andrew, and lived within a two-mile radius of King's Cross Station. It is speculated that the cases could be linked. To this day, it is not known what happened to 14-year-old Andrew Gosden. The Gosden family kept his room as he left it, and even refused to change the locks as he had taken his key with him. They continue to search for answers about their son, and hope that he is healthy and safe. If you have any information regarding the case, or would like to share your opinions, let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and we hope you found our video interesting. Like, comment and subscribe for more fascinating unsolved mysteries.